Kamar Taj, Kathmandu, Nepal, July 2, 2012. Two weeks had passed and I still hadn't managed to successfully repair the teacup that the Ancient One had given me to practice with. At first all I had managed to accomplish was get the broken pieces to rearrange themselves, and although the cup looked intact it fell apart the moment I ended the spell. I ended up getting frustrated after several days of getting the same result, before deciding that I just wasn't giving the spell enough energy. The next attempt ended with a shapeless lump of clay and powdered glaze. The good news is that I did figure out how to reverse the spell, and although I did end up with a bit of a headache by trying to make the teacup remember how it was before it was before, I did finally manage to get it back into one piece, which I then had to break again, so that I could continue my training. Other than that the rest of my training had been going great. There was an astounding number of new books available to me now that I was an apprentice, and the time that I had previously spent with the novices each morning was now spent among the more experienced apprentices and disciples. Now I was being taught how to actually fight with magic, instead of just creating simple shapes. Learning how to form weapons and shields out of energy is awesome. Sadly, that's just about all that they could teach me about fighting with magic, since the very nature of the energies we were shaping didn't allow for things like magic missiles. The other issue was that, while they were able to teach me how to generate said weapons and shields, most of the people around me were masters of the mystic arts, not the martial arts. While they did practice a special form of martial arts developed to help channel dimensional energies through the body, its offensive and defensive abilities were rather lacking when compared to what I had been taught during my years at the facility. By this point it was getting hard for me to find a fellow apprentice to spar against, and most of the higher ranked disciples were usually too busy either sparring with each other, or personally training the least skilled among us. I could practice the forms, but I had already easily memorized and perfected them as best I could without a sufficient sparring partner with which to hone my skill. I didn't expect this day to be any different as I dressed myself in my crimson apprentice robes, securing my treasured sling ring with the loop of cord built into the right side of the belt that had provided with the new robes. I also hadn't expected to find Baron Mordo waiting for me when I walked out of the tower into the training area. I hear you've been causing problems, Baron Mordo told me with a hard look in his eyes, and his thick arms crossed over his chest. I'm, sorry. I apologized, looking at him in confusion. What problems have I been causing? You're not sparring with your fellow apprentices, Baron Mordo pointed out. And you've been setting a bad example by practicing different styles than what they are trying to learn. I closed my eyes for a moment, wondering exactly how much to tell the man I knew would later go around removing the ability for sorcerers to channel dimensional energy through their bodies. For all of his good intentions, Baron Mordo's worldview was to strict, to black and white, to handle the moral gray areas one must often walk in order to save the world. I do not know how much the Ancient One might have told you about my past, I finally said, opening my eyes, but I grew up in a lab surrounded by people that did their best to turn me into a living weapon. They hired the best trainers money could buy, and when my first sensei stopped treating me like an animal they forced me to kill him, replacing him with a woman that hated me, blaming me for what they had forced me to do. So, compared to that, it's no surprise none of my fellow apprentices want to spar with me. I gave Baron Mordo a half-hearted, what can you do, kind of shrug, receiving a raised eyebrow in return. I see, Baron Mordo replied, giving me a nod. Perhaps what you need is a proper challenge, then? Follow me. I received several curious glances, and a few jealous glares, when Baron Mordo led me past my fellow apprentices on our way across the rooftop courtyards that sat between the numerous towers of Kamar Taj. The remote training area he had chosen for us that morning was mostly empty, with a few weapon racks scattered around the edges holding training staffs, and a pair of higher ranked disciples sparring with each other off to one side. So, let's see what you're made of, then, Baron Mordo said, dropping into a ready stance. I immediately fell into my own ready stance, lowering my center of gravity and balancing my weight on the balls of my feet, once more fighting the urge to pop out my claws as I brought my arms up to guard my torso. It did not take long before Baron Mordo decided to test my defenses, and I was forced to duck as he sent roundhouse kick towards where my head had been moments ago, though I was able to force him off balance when I punched the back of his leg as it passed over me. Good reflexes, Baron Mordo complimented me as he tested his weight on the leg I had hit. But not good enough. He came at me again, this time aiming a punishing flurry of punches towards my torso, forcing me on the defensive. He then tried to sneak in a sweeping kick to the back of my leg, but I used the force of the blow to launch myself into a spin kick of my own, which caused him to stumble back several steps when he was forced to block it with his forearms. Better, he noted, his dark eyes narrowing. 
He came at me again, this time intent to initiate a grapple, where his greater mass and reach would put him at a natural advantage. When extended his right arm to grab at me I slapped it aside with my own right hand, instinctively grabbing hold of his wrist and putting punishing pressure on his radial nerve as I used the momentum of his own blow to pull him down to one knee. This left the right side open for attack, and I just managed to stop my hand an inch away from the side of his neck. Taking a deep breath, I gently released the hold I still had on his wrist and took several steps back to give him some room. That had been, close. If my claws had been out, he would have been dead. That. Baron Mordo gasped out. Was much better. But you're still, holding back. I couldn't help but shake my head as he got back to his feet, making obvious use of dimensional energies to accelerate his own healing as he got his wind back. It was nowhere near as effective as my own healing factor, but my attack had been fairly non-damaging, in spite of the amount of pain I had just put him through. It wouldn't take long before he was back in fighting form. I'm not the only one holding back, I pointed out as I waited for him to recover. I can tell you're used to fighting with a weapon. So are you, Baron Mordo replied, taking a deep breath as he took a neutral stance. Some kind of punching dagger, from what I've seen so far. Close enough, I thought to myself. Baron Mordo stood there for a moment with a measuring look in his eyes, before giving a slight nod to himself. He then turned and walked over to one of the nearby weapon racks, grabbing a two-foot length of wood before walking back over to stand in front of me. This is a relic, Baron Mordo explained, holding the length of wood up by one end. Some magic is too powerful to sustain, so we imbue objects with it. Allowing them to take the strain that we cannot. This is the staff of the Living Tribunal. He grabbed the other end of the staff and pulled, separating the sections to reveal the sparking cords of eldritch energy that held the weapon together. He then swung the staff like a whip, striking the ground beside him with a loud snap of released energy, sparks and smoke briefly flying from where the staff had hit the bricks. He then held the staff up in the air once more, allowing it return to its original form. There are many relics, he continued. The Wand of Watum. The vaulting boots of Valter, he kicked up a heel, creating a short-lived mandala platform from said boots. Now, conjure a weapon. Fucking, okay, so now apparently this is happening, I thought to myself, conjuring a pair of mandala shields as he came charging at me. I was able to block the first few blows he sent at me with the staff of the living tribunal, the sheer force behind the relic quickly sapping the strength from my shields as he kept me on the defensive. I ducked under his next blow, only to have to hold both shields above my head when the staff extended once more, causing my shields to finally collapse in a shower of sparks when the far end of the staff crashed down on me from above. Fight! Baron Mordo commanded as I rolled with the force of his blow. Fight as if your life depends on it. I quickly conjured another pair of shields as I rolled back onto my feet, blocking the next blow from his staff with one shield, while swinging at him with the other. I missed with the blow I had tried to land on his midsection when he used his boots to vault into the air, only to have the extended length of his staff wrap around that arm as he used his boots to run in a circle on the air behind me, pulling me off balance. He yanked on his end of the staff, giving me just enough warning to get my other shield in position as he landed a punishing kick aimed at my upper back, allowing me to roll away from him as the shield killed off a majority of the force behind the blow. Baron Mordo had not only the advantage of reach with that staff of his, but also in mobility thanks to his vaulting boots, which allowed him to dominate the fight as he kept me at range. The shields that I had conjured, while a better defense than the silly cat's cradle that Doctor Strange would prefer, were nearly useless in a fight like this. I would need something more versatile myself if I wanted to stand a chance of winning this fight. Taking a page from the Ancient One's own playbook, I collapsed my mandala shields, reshaping the energy into the same war fan constructs that she preferred herself. Their new shape allowed the energy to be concentrated along the leading edge of the fans, trading in defense for a greater offense. There was also another advantage that the war fans had over the shields, they could be thrown. Baron Mordo made a sweeping blow with the whip-like form of the staff, and instead of trying to block his attack I folded my knees and ducked, throwing one of my fans out to the side as his weapon left a trail of sparking energy above my head. I leapt at him from my crouched position as he tried to recover from his missed blow, the fan that I had thrown spinning around like a boomerang and striking him in the back of his knee sending him even further off balance as I came flying towards him. He had just enough time to widen his eyes before I landed on him, hitting him in the abdomen with both of my knees, and riding him down as the force of my body hitting him drove him onto his back. He had the air driven out of his lungs with the force of the initial strike, 
and again when I landed on him with the full weight of my body as he crashed to the ground. I held the glowing edge of one mandala fan against the bottom of his chin, he had just opened his eyes when I snapped my other hand up into the air to catch the other fan as it came flying back. He looked up at me in confusion for a moment as he struggled to breathe, before a look of realization entered his eyes, causing him to drop his head back down to the ground. I stepped off of him the moment he realized he had been beaten, releasing the energy I had been channeling into my mandala fans and allowing them to fade away in a brief shower of sparks. Once I was back on my own feet I noticed that the two disciples that had been sparring nearby had stopped at some point to watch our fight, and were now staring at me with wide eyes. I, knew you were, holding back, Baron Mordo gasped out, as he slowly got up from the ground. That was much, better. Thank you, I said, giving him a respectful bow. I hope you now understand why I am hesitant to spar with the other apprentices. I do indeed, he agreed, taking a moment to dust himself off before bending over to pick his staff up from where it had landed. Perhaps it is for the best. You may spend the rest of this morning with your other studies, and I will speak to the Ancient One about this issue. Thank you, Master Mordo, I said. I gave him another bow as he off towards the nearest tower, before turning to make my way back down to my bedroom, ignoring the two disciples that had watched our fight. Once I had sat back down at my desk I stared at the once more broken teacup for a couple of minutes, before deciding to check my email first. There was of course the expected email from Natasha, asking all kinds of veiled questions hidden behind the guise of being friendly and helpful. Nothing from mom yet, but I knew how busy she had been recently between going through all of the paperwork from the facility, and taking care of my four sisters. Speaking of sisters. To, Laura Kinney. From, Belladonna Kinney. Subject, Re, Hi Sis. Hi Sis. You won't believe what Zelda and Gabby got into yesterday. The two of them had left this morning for a walk out in the woods surrounding the house that Natasha had taken to, and when they hadn't returned by lunchtime mom sent me and Paris out to look for them. We found them easy enough. We also found out why they hadn't returned yet. Apparently they had found a family of red foxes while they were out, and the two of them were taking turns petting them while the other went out to catch field mice to feed to them. They both got real upset when we told them we couldn't take their new friends home with us. Zelda even ended up climbing up into one of the trees, refusing to come back down until we promised her that they could come back out to visit the foxes later. Mom acted real stern with them when we got back to the house, but I caught her smiling after she sent them upstairs to get washed up. I also saw Mom looking up information about foxes on her computer when I walked past her office last night, so who knows what might happen. Love ya. Belladonna. 2. Belladonna Kinney. From, Laura Kinney. Subject, Re, Hi Sis. Hi, Belle. Oh, Goddess. First honey badgers, now foxes. What will those girls get up to next? It does seem a little strange that they act so different, though, since all of you were given a copy of my memories. Maybe it's their own physical ages catching back up to them. Have you noticed any changes happening to you or Paris? Love ya. Laura. Kamartaj, Kathmandu, Nepal. July 3, 2012. There was a servant waiting to take me to the Ancient One when I walked out of my bedroom the following morning, and I found myself once more being led down the familiar path to what I had mentally dubbed the Ancient One's office. The Ancient One was standing facing away from me in the middle of the room when I entered, and I could see her rolling her wooden folding fan in her hands as she held them behind her back. She made no immediate move to acknowledge my presence, but I did notice the tops of her ears twitch when I came to a stop several feet away from her. There was a long moment of silence broken only by the soft wooden clack of her folding fan before she decided to speak to me. I find it interesting that you can cause so much trouble, while still following all of the instructions given to you, the Ancient One commented, before finally turning to face me. Master Mordo is one of our most skilled fighters here at Kamar Taj, and yet you still beat him even though he was armed with a relic. I shifted awkwardly beneath the weight of her gaze, as I found myself unsure of how to respond. While it did feel good to know that I had the ability to defeat one of the best fighters here, though not without significant effort, that also meant that my own growth as a fighter would be limited during the rest of my time here. I recognize that look on your face, the Ancient One said, narrowing her eyes at me. Master Mordo might be one of the best fighters here, but not the best. There is still much for you to learn. Follow me. The Ancient One made a throwing motion with one hand towards the middle of the room, and reality bent to her will as the air appeared to shatter like glass, before transforming into a wall of prisms. 
I couldn't help but feel a sense of wonder as I followed her into the mirror dimension, leaving this reality for the first time in my new life. I don't need to tell you where we are, I hope, the Ancient One asked me as she came to a stop, turning to face me once more. Ah, no, Ancient One, I replied. Good, she nodded. Master Mordo tells me that your skills with a war fan are respectable. You have had training in their use before. I have, I agreed. My original sensei did train me in Tessenjutsu, along with many other fighting styles. I see, the Ancient One said. Show me. Yes, Ancient One, I replied with a quick bow. Following her request, I summoned a pair of mandala fans and began going through the series of Tessenjutsu Kata that I had learned from my sensei, showing her what I had been taught. The fans repeatedly snapped open and closed with a practice twitch of my wrist, the mandala forms reshaping themselves to my subconscious will as I went through form after form under her watchful gaze. Once I was done with the final kata I stood at attention with the folded mandala fans resting along the length of my forearms, awaiting the ancient one's judgment. We will need to work on your form, she noted. You were obviously taught at a much younger age, and you have not been keeping up with the changes happening with your growing body. I blushed when I realized exactly what kind of changes she was talking about, as I had been taught this particular style before I hit in puberty. Having a photographic memory was great for learning things like languages and spells, but it was a double-edged sword when it came to physical skills. While it was great that I could remember every lesson I had learned as if it had just happened, that also meant that the muscle memory I had gained during those lessons was based on the body I had at the time. Since I wasn't likely to stop growing for a few more years, hopefully to gain at least a few more inches of height, I would have to continually practice those skills to adapt with those changes. Do not worry, the Ancient One told me. The mirror dimension will give you a safe place to practice your skills, away from prying eyes. You shall join me here each morning during the time you would have normally spent training beside your fellow apprentices. Awesome. I mean, I nervously cleared my throat. Thank you, Ancient One. Oh, don't thank me yet, she told me with small smile. While you have shown that you know the forms, you have yet to show me how well you can use them in an actual fight. So, I say again. Show me. Oh, crap, I thought to myself as the Ancient One formed her own mandala fans. This, is going to hurt. What had followed was an ass whooping of epic proportions, as the Ancient One showed me just what it felt like to be on the receiving end of 700 years of experience. The sun was setting by the time I came stumbling out of the gateway that she had opened to let us out of the mirror dimension, the fading light revealing the scuffed and torn appearance of my once pristine apprentice robes. I felt bruised and beaten all over, even though my healing factor had already taken care of the physical damage I had received during the course of the day's training. That took longer than I intended, the Ancient One confessed as she followed me out, closing the gateway behind her. I will have to ensure that we limit the time we spend training to the morning hours, as I do not want your other studies to suffer. We shall continue your training tomorrow. In the meantime, perhaps it might be a good idea to practice the repair spell on your robes? Why yeah, that's probably a good idea, I agreed, shuffling towards the exit. I did not ask for a hug before leaving. By the time I got back to my bedroom I was too tired to even make an attempt to repair my robes, let alone read any of the books I had stacked on my desk. I had enough robes to last me for at least a few days, and the Kamar Taj library didn't have any late fees. Instead, I stripped down to my underclothes and grabbed my cell phone so that I could lay down in bed and check my email before getting some much-deserved sleep. To, Laura Kinney. From, Belladonna Kinney. Subject, Re, Hi Sis. Hi Sis. I asked Mom, and she agrees that we are all starting to act more our age. She mentioned something about the other scientists giving you medicine to control your hormones while you were growing up so that you were easier to control, and without those, nature is taking its course. Those were her exact words. I have your memories of going through puberty, and I don't think any of us are looking forward to experiencing it again firsthand, especially if the pills they were giving you made it any easier. On the other hand, mom did mention something about our healing factor preventing called the menstrual cycle from moving past the follicular phase. She used a whole lot of sciency words for it, but apparently that means that we don't get periods like she does. It really scared me and our sisters the first time that happened to mom and we smelled her bleeding. We all thought that she had gotten hurt, and it took a long time for her to get us all to calm down. The less said about the discussion that followed the better. Love ya. Bell. Okay, so that explained why I hadn't needed to use any of the pads I had bought back in Quebec City, even though two months had already passed. 
I hadn't really put much thought into it, since I had never experienced a period in my new life, though I had presumed that had been caused by the medication the scientists had been giving me to control my hormones. I certainly didn't have any first-hand experience in my past life, having lacked the necessary equipment. And yet, I couldn't help but feel a bit sad when I realized that I had more in common with Natasha than I had originally thought. I certainly didn't have any intent to have sex with a man, as my own preference for the female form had carried over from my previous life, but I had never really thought about how my new healing factor would affect my ability to become pregnant. Even if somehow one of my eggs became fertilized within my body, would my healing factor even recognize the cells of my child, or would it get rid of it like any other foreign matter that entered my body? I had a hard time getting to sleep that night, in spite of my exhaustion. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.